you know, international readings. Um, I think we may even do something like combination readings with American and British, uh, American and Australian, Australian and, and British poets as we go as well. South African poets, Kenyan poets, um, and of course, always American poets as well. <laughs> May it mute all. All right, there we go. To the 38th episode of Lip Balm. Today, guest emceed by the young upstart poet Karina Van Berkham, um, who is about to release an amazing book this next year. Uh, and our future today uh, includes Gloria Minduk, Annie Pluto, Tim Shawmont, and Pui Wong. Um, welcome, everybody. And let's get started. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Karina for a second. She's going to introduce Jonathan. Can you hear me? We can now. Yeah. Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's amazing to hear that it's the 38th. I started attending Lit Bomb back in April, I think. Um, so it's a pleasure to be guest emceeing. And we have some wonderful readers today. But um, now I'll introduce uh, Jonathan Penton. Um, in 1998, Jonathan Penton founded unlikelystories.org, an electronic journal of literature and art. Since then, he has lent editorial and management assistance to a number of literary and artistic ventures, such as Mad Hat Inc., the New Orleans Poetry Festival, Rigorous, and Big Bridge. In 2005, he founded Unlikely Books, which publishes three to five books of poetry a year. He has organized literary performances and performed himself across the United States. His poetry books are Last Chap from Virgin Press 2004, Blood and Salsa and Painting Rust, from Unlikely Books in 2006, Prosthetic Gods, New Sins Press slash Winged City Chapbooks, 2008, Standards of Sat Sadity, Lit Fest Press, 2016, and the free eChap Backstories, which you can download from um, Argotist eBooks. Is that right? That's right. Right. Um, and we're excited to hear uh, a poem from Jonathan. Thank you. So regulars know that what I usually do, rather than read uh, my own work, just because I'm not very prolific, is that I typically read something we've recently published in Unlikely Stories. Um, Unlikely Stories is on hiatus, so I'm reading from some Unlikely Books, and I'd like to read from one of our 2020 Unlikely Books, Political AF, a Rage Collection by Tara Campbell. And I'm going to read uh, Tara Campbell's Shut Up and Dribble. Shut up and dribble, shut up and play. Shut up and stand for the anthem. Shut up and step out of the car. Shut up and put your hands behind your head. Shut up and bleed. Shut up about your wrongful death suit. Shut up about your rights. Shut up and take your Mylar blanket. Shut up and get in the cage. Shut up and learn English. Shut up about where's your mommy. Shut up and change the other girl's diaper and tell her to shut up about where hers mommy. Just shut up and eat your apple. And shut up and cook our food while we lock up your children. Shut up about the annulments clause. Shut up about family deals in China. Shut up and drink the water in Flint. Shut up and sit in the dark in Puerto Rico. Shut up about your crumbling schools and shut up about the bullet riddled children inside. Shut up about the alt-right. Shut up about neo-Nazis. Shut up about full-on Nazis. Shut up about tiki torches. Shut up about the very fine people on both sides. Shut up about swastikas on headstones. Shut up about human rights that upsets our new totalitarian allies. Shut up about Standing Rock. Shut up about, about your treaties. Shut up about your land. Shut up about coal dust in the rivers. Shut up about pipelines spilling oil out of their seams. Shut up about the factories that haven't reopened. Shut up about the coal mines that haven't reopened. Shut up, shut up about jobs that don't pay living wages. Shut up about jobs that have been automated. Shut up about jobs that haven't come back from overseas. Shut up about the middle class. The middle class is not a right. Shut up about your wedding cake. Shut up about your equal pay. Shut up about your birth control. Shut up about your pre-existing conditions. Shut up about your baby's heart disease. Health insurance is not a right. Shut up about tax cuts. 
Shut up about budget cuts. Shut up about your Medicare. Shut up about your Medicaid. Shut up about your social security. You weren't supposed to notice when they go. Shut up about the shining city on the hill. Shut up about the Statue of Liberty. She's French anyway. Shut up about the melting pot. Shut up about the American experience. Do you know the right setting for how he always sat down? I'm very sorry. Shut up about the American dream, it's not for you. This dream isn't a wish your heart makes, but something you build on stolen land with your father's money and the shreds of a tattered soul. So shut up about all that, because all I want to hear is the thwack of a golf ball and the fiddle and the flames. All right, again, that was by Tara Campbell from her 2020 book, Political AF, a Rage Collection. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our new co-host, Cassandra Atherton. Cassandra Atherton is an award-winning writer, scholar of prose poetry, and professor of writing and literature in Melbourne, Australia. Her most recent books of prose poetry are Pre-Raphaelite, Leftovers, and Fugitive Letters. She is currently writing a book of prose poetry on the atomic bomb with funding from the Australia Council. I've seen it, it's really good. <laughs> Cassandra co-wrote Prose Poetry, An Introduction, and the Anthology of Australian Prose Poetry. She is commissioning editor for Westerly Magazine. Cassandra, are you gonna read something today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so anyone who knows me knows I'm obsessed with the Pre-Raphaelites and I was asked to put a 21 prose poem chat book together, um, choosing some Pre-Raphaelite paintings to write ecrastic poems too. So this one's called Beata Beatrix. If you elegize me, do it slowly. Don't write a pantoum one evening over a chicken curry or a villanelle on the train between suburban stations. Take your time, compose the prose poem longhand in a notebook with a fountain pen. Buy an inkwell and fill it with pink ink. Let it stain your writing fingers. Set aside a few nights each month to put in commas and take out adjectives. Picture me in every metonym and alliteration. Imagine us inhabiting the spaces between words. When it's finished, don't publish it. Make a bonfire and watch the paper catch and burn, the letters taking off like hundreds of fireflies in the starless night. I have the pleasure of introducing Mark Vincennes. And if I mispronounce anything, I'm gonna say it's my Australian accent, okay? So Mark Vincennes is an Anglo-Swiss American poet a fiction writer, translator, editor, publisher, designer, multi-genre artist and musician. He has published 14 books of poetry, including more recently Becoming the Sound of Bees, Leaning into the Infinite, The Syndicate of Water and Light, and Here Comes the Night Dust. I love that title, that's my fave. Vincenza's newest collection, The Little Book of Earthly Desires and a novella set in ancient China, Three Tao of Tao, or How to Catch a Fortuitous Elephant are both forthcoming in 2021 from Spite and Dival. He told you he was prolific. An album of music, ambience and verse, Left Hand Clapping is also forthcoming from Tree Torn Records. Vincenz is also a prolific translator and has translated from the German, Romanian and French. He has published 10 books of translations, most recently Unexpected Development by award-winning Swiss poet and novelist Klaus Mertz, White Pine, 2018, which was a finalist for the 2016 Cliff Becker Book Prize in translation. His translation of Klaus Mertz's selected poems and Audible Blue is forthcoming from White Pine Press in 2021. His poems have been published in many journals, including The Nation, Plowshares, The Los Angeles Review, World Literature Today, Raritan, Asymptote, and Plume. His work has received fellowships and grants from the Swiss Arts Council, the Literary Colloquium, uh, or Colloquium Ber Berlin, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Wittner Brinner Foundation for Poetry. Vincennes is editor and publisher at Mad Hat Press and publisher of New American Writing. He's lived all over the world, from Brazil to China to Iceland to India. He was born in Matilda Hospital on the peak in Hong Kong, but he now lives on a farm in rural Western Massachusetts, overlooking Herman Melville's Greylock Mountain, where there are more coyotes than, and bears than people. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Cassandra. 
Um, I'm going to read two short poems today. The first one's called Wading Through Piles of Garbage. Oh, that thrill underneath your fit feet of an artificial ski slope built on yesterday's refuse. It gives way, but not too much, like walking on a sponge or a thick rubberized yoga mat, barefooted. It's the plastics that give it the spring. Thousands of creatures have found their way in here, salamanders, snakes, newts, crickets, ants, and weevils. Uh, what's this? Here's a broken body wheezing, a slightly hunched back TV screen, a radio that once had the privilege of speaking to the unemployed. To think that a god made all this, all this leftover dreams and desires and the longing for four rooms and a balcony or built-in air conditioning. The thousand drawers once filled the old armchairs, sprung here, sprung there. A small antique table with a fleur-de-lis, a beautiful square of yellow plastic. Right now, a sparrow flits between peaks. The wildlife is thick overhead. The seagulls dive, the troughs and valleys. Every once in a while, there's a squawking frenzy. What a treasure this is, they're singing. What a treasure this is. Poem number one, <laughs> poem number two. And this is a very short one. And it's called, From the Sum of Its Quarks. Who is the son of the flower? or the daughter of the seed? Who is the emperor in his final decree? Or the wisdom of Saul, or the seeds who cross the other river? Or that brief journey over mysterious lands? What? The one through the petrified forest? Did it not suffice for me to have suffered under the boot? You forget the howl and the espresso. Don't remind me again. We must not part with what we see. And next up we have our guest MC, Karina, Karina Van Berkham. Um, Karina also will be running the feature today. Karina is an editor, poet, and teacher. Her work has appeared in publications such as Plowshares, Five Points, and Strange Horizons, for which she received the Risling Award nomination. She was a 2016 Robert Pinsky Poetry Teaching Fellow at Boston University, where she received the Hurley Prize in Poetry. Karina lives with her dog, uh, Lady Macbeth, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she is the editorial project coordinator for MIT Sloan Management Review, and the co-editor of Spoke, a poetry annual, uh, which I believe is just wrapping its new issue together. Is that right, Karina? Yes, absolutely. I'll, I can give a little bit more information about that in a bit. But yeah, we have uh, we finished our, our seventh year. Wow. And Karina's first book of poetry will be uh, published by Mad Hat Press this next year. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, take it away, Karina. Thank you, Mark. Thanks a lot. And, and beautiful poems. Um, I. Uh, like Jonathan, I'm not the most prolific, so I'm now second guessing that I've re read this poem some, at some point on this in an open mic, um, but I'm gonna read it anyway. Um, and um, this poem is called Becoming Twins. Every night my children work hard to become twins. They seem to nearly congeal, put rocks in each other's little shoes to match limps, share an orange, five and a half bright wedges each. If they could, they'd stitch themselves together. Real needles, real thread. I had to laugh when they asked permission. The blood on our animal baby's carpet would happily combine. When I wake up childless, am I relieved? Am I one of them? Who would be a mother who could help it? I eat my own 11 drippy wedges, ruined for love. Um, so now I think that I will just uh, go right into the features section. 
Um, and uh, I'll start with uh, Annie, if you don't mind, Annie. Um, let me just pull up your bio here. So Annie Pluto will be starting off our feature section. Annie Pluto grew up in Brooklyn, New York. She is professor of literature and theater at Lesley University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she is the artistic director of the Oxford Street Players. She is one of the founders and editors at Nix's Mate Review, um, or Nix's Mate Books. Her latest book is The Deepest Part of Dark um, with Unlikely Stories Press. And we're looking forward to hear your work. Annie, take it away. Thank you. It's great to be here uh, among friends and publishers. So I'm going to read from uh, The Deepest Part of Dark that came out from Unlikely Books this past year. So there'll be a few love poems and then um, we'll switch to the season, you know, which is Christmas. So this one's called One More Line Than a Sonnet. I found you last night on the web, no longer the handsome boy from upstate New York, native to the town where they hold the state fair. We spoke Russian together when we were 18 and lost the chance to have a family at 20 and then again when I was 22 and you couldn't care less or more your state of negation and mine of despair. I enjoined pain then, it was what I grew, where my talent lay. Now, three decades later, you have emerged scientist, businessman, developer, of a plastic used by soldiers. There is a photograph of you bending this miracle fabric in your left hand toward the camera, your once handsome face distorted. For all my heart had held, I would not have known you anywhere. And this one is called Infinite Forever and it's for Colleen. The honey locust trees fan golden out to cast the early October memory of forgetting where I turned the heat back on last year. This is the wide season of painful repetition. Time does not matter. It's only the light caught between what is tangible and what cannot remain. Your death is another hole in the pattern, another birthday that will pass and pass unnoticed. Just a twinge of no regrets and finally, hereditary heartbreak and ghosts. Would they call you out through the lone and, long and lonely corridor, hear the sound of your boots in the snow, the city lit up at midnight? We'll catch a glimpse of our former selves in the plate glass downtown Christmas window. It's the photo no one ever took of us together, stretches out into the infinite forever. How do I say words in love language? that only the dead can hear. This next one is a title poem for this book, The Deepest Part of Dark, and it's for CR. My first love came last night in the deepest part of dark to welcome me with open heart and spoke of visits yet to make, Capri, Sardinia, and Calabria, the naval view behind his tour of duty now we talked of time abridged, the decades flipping fast from where he first set sail. I stood lost, without redemption, with no amends. My first love came once to whisper sad goodbye. His death called me to put a hold on time. We never came back. Tonight the visit lost, no bitter photo left to share. Together, Capri. Sardinia, Calabria, we never made it there. This one is called Life Preserver. I threw you a life preserver, something round, white and red, into the redolent sea of faces, on gray sidewalks and trees that grew in Brooklyn, cracking the dry pavement into humps of ground unworthy of roller skating or bike riding, above our walking carefully between our neighborhoods, where the mimosa tree in your mother's yard yielded perfume and soft pink memory. I reeled you in, but the Navy took you away 
as I faded, a point in the concrete horizon, a girl with dark hair, the first love you had let go when the sea became dark. Beware, a storm settles between us, the table set for three. I always sat under the blessed mother in her orthodox red and gold, the ottoman curve in the architecture of the frame around her. The other, I sat behind the table where I made mistakes and knocked over glasses that spilled and the other two yelled in concert, mother wiping up the sour cream, not worth crying over, the father shaking his head. And I wanted to be outside where the trees grew in Brooklyn, even on our dead end street, a block from the subway, where I knew for a small token of no one's affection, you could make a choice, take the direction, either to the sea or into the vast stone city. Now we'll switch to the season. And um, this one is called <clears throat> The Three Kings and it's for Vladimir, who's my father. January rain, water turns to black ice. No snow as predicted last year. It was standing room only where I watched them pray. I had wanted to light your way to Christmas. In the wisdom the dead possess, you must by now have forgiven me. My prayer was to Mary. What I asked for, I received this January. I'll find candle and in the church, I'll say your name among the believers. It will not matter if I belong this year, I found a place in the dark where I struck a hundred thousand matches and played with fire. This one is called Twelfth Night. In the dark, the crescent moon illuminates the road, the river, and my retreat. I'm heavy with stagnation, no, move to room, no room to move in either direction. Let Mary take my place, and I will be her icon, assume the silent knowledge, the moment of birth and joy, the precious baby whose fate she didn't think of when turban kings laid gold at her feet. Silent Mary, Holy Mary, you can have my heart. In exchange for your peace, it's indignant and damaged, but you've seen worse. Take it from me, fill its fissures with gold, seal them with myrrh, and frankincense will signify the holiday. Wear it as a jewel and take my place. I will hold your son against my empty chest, his heart strong enough to keep us both alive. And I've been working on um, acrostic poems uh, with a friend of mine named Lisa Levine. She's a photographer and her series is called There's No Place Like Home. And they're photographs of houses and there's a whole series of them that are from Lubbock, Texas, and we both have a connection there. So uh, the title of this poem is called Mary Light in Texas, and it's going to be the title of the collection of poems. She's come over the border in full cover, in white carrying along the scent of roses and corn. She's wearing snakes around her ankles and throwing pomegranate seeds along the river. She's found her predecessor, Venus, and taken refuge in the half-shell light of a full Texas moon. She's guarding the houses, the women, and all the children who passed on too soon. And I'm going to end with um, a love poem. We'll go back to a love poem, but it's, it's called Christmas. I'd gladly follow them, three men from the east, having watched the moon and stars forever searching from their Persian tower, where now their tombs stand turquoise studded blue reaching heaven. Did it burn them into splendor when they pack their gifts and saddle camels for the journey west? And could he really have been, still been newborn or was he already his mother's splendid son whose uncommon life and violent death had yet 
to open, a book we all have read and read again. This Christmas, the story passes through me as if you had entered. Welcome home, this star, it burns for me as you, brilliant, golden, the light you bring me from the West, your skin as it ignites my own and turn together into the rope of our surrender. I gladly follow you this Christmas to any manger where they came to and brought their gifts for a healer, a holy man, and a king. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Annie. That was beautiful. The, uh, the line about the, the, the two beating hearts, uh, the beating heart being enough for, to keep both of them alive, striking. Um, I'm gonna now uh, introduce Gloria Mindock. Um, Gloria is the editor of Servana Barva Press and one of the USA editors for the Louvre Literataire. Uh, that is my French accent. Her sixth collection of poetry called Ash is forthcoming from Glass Lyre Press. Gloria has been translated and published into nine languages. She was poet laureate in Somerville, Massachusetts in 2017 and 2018. Gloria has been awarded the Ib Ibst, uh, Ibbotson Street Press Lifetime Achievement Award, the Allen Ginsberg Award for Community Service, and the fifth and 40th Moon Prize from Writing in a Woman's Voice. She has new poems forthcoming in Gargoyle and Spoke, which I know very well. Um, welcome, Gloria. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to everyone at Lit Bomb, and it's so nice to read with friends, so it's a real honor. And I'll start out reading from Whiteness of Bone, and it focuses on the atrocities in El Salvador, Rwanda, and numerous other countries. And this poem um, has to do with the massacre in El Mozote, and uh, Rufina Amaya was the lone survivor and so this poem is for her and she died, I think a few years back for Amaya. Alone, hiding in a ditch, listening to gunshots, afraid to move, screams buried into the dirt, husband, children, relatives, friends, shot, hacked. The men, their arms are bold as they swing. How much blood did this planet drink? a landscape of red, flesh cut deep on display. Existence disappeared, but memories live. As the years go by, the calendars mark it. In El Mozote, there are bones for the archeologists to dig up. A grave so deep, lives intertwined, shadows covering everyone with a blanket. And next I'll read uh, one poem from I Wish Francisco Franco Would Love Me. Reaching. Empty shoes on the road, clothing left, death hugged so many today. Others will now wear the shoes, feel the garments against their skin in this poor village. Dead bodies, just another number of statistics in this country. Sad to be a disappearing shadow. Sad, the world has adjusted to death, pain diluted into the living. They are numb, hollow. Life's bony fingers reach out, but have been disembodied. There will be no justice for the dead. The implication of just not dealing with it extends from country to country. The families weep, remember their loved ones and their concern for action buried with a secret longing, a silence that breaks glass and stabs the unbroken. And my sixth collection called Ash um, is forthcoming. And the poems are inspired by all the horrible breakup stories. Um, that I heard from my clients as I worked as a social worker for 39 years and retired happily. <laughs> so um, a lot of my images use 
fire and ash. And this is called sky. The dark sky attacked my heart with only thing it knows, lightning. Such a pounding in my chest, despite being half burnt, my valves still beating. When the wind blew into my face, I could not breathe, my gasping loud. Finally, when the rain hit, I was drowning in the drops, saturated. There was little hope for me. When the sun returned, I was gone. The air was crisp, the sky was clear. Like when someone dies, the emptiness is always there. Many of my clients were Catholic, and so it made me think of writing these poems, uh, the next two. Uh, this is called The Crossing, excuse me, The Crosses. We have broken crosses in our drawer. Why are they still here? It is a sin to throw out the symbol of Christ. We would fall from grace. The sacraments received on Sunday would be for nothing. So here they are, buried by papers, screws, ink pens, pennies, a few rubber bands. How sad, Christ defending himself from junk. Where is his heart? Take the crosses out, let him breathe. Put the pieces in every room, out in the open, each one giving testimony to your life. This next one is called, what if, what if God is strict? I am looking for the right flesh with no bleeding. My voice free, hanging from the crucifix. Passion from these lips, igniting sins to clot my, my mouth. Crucifixes break every day, are shoved into a drawer, collect dust in a thrift shop. Sometimes, Jesus becomes so dusty that cleaning him is a problem. The dust too thick to let him resurrect. When he does, he sneezes. Maybe Jesus will develop an allergy, a miracle of life. This next poem comes from a section in the book called Opposition and there are seven parts and this is just one of them. And J is the initial not, not a name. Jay loved fake names. He was a burnt out novelist, wrote too many stories about horrific blind dates. He was a wild man, too many plastic bags in his kitchen. He would kill you, burn you, pretending it was love. M was an elementary teacher, went out with Jay. She thought he was popular, would bring her wealth. M was wrong. Her fate lay at the water's edge, an alligator. And I'll close with a poem that uh, is a true story. Uh, a client of mine could never stay away from women, no matter how much I told him to. And he would come back with these date stories that would have all of us roaring. I mean, we were doubled over. And so I decided to write about it. So the first three stanzas are true and the fourth one I made up. And this is called Plastic. One, X was only two months sober and he was telling everyone he had a date. Despite being told to concentrate on his sobriety and not women, he would not listen. The next day, he said they went out for dinner. Afterwards, she invited him to her place for coffee. When they walked into her apartment, there were dolls sitting at the kitchen table, on the couch, in the bedroom, and even on the toilet, doll eyes watching him, creepy. He left. We all teased him and said he should have kissed a doll. There would be no heart beating. All he would have to do is keep his lips closed. Then there would be no feeling. Two, X was sitting in the car with his date, about ready to go to dinner when she said, wait, I have to wrap my hair up in tinfoil. 
It is important for me to communicate with the aliens. X looked at her in disbelief. He took the tinfoil box from her and wrapped his head up with it, waiting for a miracle. Three. It has been a while since X went out on a date. He sat in the car with her as she smacked her gums and then stuck the chewing gum on the dashboard. Then she dug out her lipstick from her purse. X was still focusing on her gum on the dashboard. He looked around her car more closely and saw gum stuck all over the place. He felt a knot in his stomach and was disgusted, got out of the car without saying a word. About a block later, as he was thinking, he reached in his pocket and unwrapped a piece of gum and chewed. Four. The sirens were going off. X knew it was time to get out. His heart was beating quickly. X was scared he would not make it. Heavy black smoke was filling the apartment up. He jumped up and realized it was just a dream. Next to him was a woman, young and very pretty. His heart smoldered. He thought, what did I do to deserve such a thing? Just then, a fireman knocked down the door and recitated him. There was no girl, just a fire hose through the broken window. Sometimes X, a flame is just a flame. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, Gloria. Um, I'm going to now move on to Tim Shermont. Um, he will read next. Tim Shermont's six full length book of poems, A Donut and the Great Beauty of the World will be forthcoming from Mad Hat Press in 2021. He has been published in Poetry, Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, The Georgia Review, Bellevue Literary Review, Stand Magazine, December Magazine, On the Seawall, Poet Lore and Plume, among many others. He lives in Cambridge, Mass, with his wife, who we'll hear from later, the poet Pui Ying Wong. Uh, please welcome Tim. <clears throat> oh, thank you, uh, Karina. And am I coming through OK? Good, fine, fine, thank you. And thank you, Jonathan and uh, Mark and uh, Cassandra. And thank to all of you for listening. Uh, good old friends and hope maybe some good new friends. So let's start right off at the top. <laughs> I win the Nobel Prize. Immediately after I get the word, I take a walk in the neighborhood, doing nothing out of the ordinary. He's probably headed for the grocery store, some will say, if they say anything about me at all. But I can't help stopping a man and asking him what he thinks of the Nobel Prize. What's uh, noble again, he says, and I thank him and walk on. He's put everything in perspective. Yes, I did win the Nobel Prize, a miracle, but I should pick up a few items, a loaf of bread, a quart of milk for sure, since I'm already going in that direction. Longevity. The city and I have gotten older. When we walk arm in arm now for the sake of walking, this is as good as it gets, and we see clearer than ever before, as if looking through strange new eyes. What lucidity. Here's the dusk spooling over the avenue slowly both closing it down and opening it up. There's a rose on the sidewalk, a blue skateboard in the gutter. And if we wanted to levitate it along with so many other things deep into the sky, we could. The magicians touch on us at last, like stardust. And in 2019, uh, Matt had published a collection of poems of mine, uh, titled uh, Josephine Baker's Swimming Pool. And I'm gonna read a couple of poems uh, from that particular collection. John Wayne, quotation marks, John Wayne in, in Vietnam. What many of the middle school children called me while giving me an enthusiastic peace sign. All of them amazed to see an American this far out many miles away from the territory of the tourists. The girls in long white dresses, 
boys in white shirts, ties and black shorts. I pointed in the Mekong direction and said, many years ago over there, and all of us started laughing when a cow mooed and the sky turned an even brighter blue. Blue was the always a little doleful, but beautiful river. Do some fishing along the Seine, but my fishing days are over. Pity for the fish is my excuse. I stand on a bridge and watch all the history and art and a group of pretty women in pretty dresses, all of them cradling books. I couldn't be happier. And as Karina mentioned, uh, later next year, I'll have another collection from Mad Hat called A Donut and the Great Beauty of the World. And I'll read one poem from that called Walking with My Heart After a Disappointment. It could be worse, I say to it, and it's well aware of what I mean. Feel the crisp air and look at the sunlight oozing over the gas station sign. Jesus, it doesn't get better than this. My heart is coming around to my thinking, this heightened optimism that may doom us, but what a wonderful doom. I'm standing fast like Martin Luther, mine is the theological falter all, and my heart affirms, staring with his red sash held oh so high. And early on in this terrible pandemic that we've been having, let me see here, can I see everybody here? There we go. There we are. Okay, now I can see everybody again. I was looking at my, at my almost blank screen. Uh, this is the, the first poem that I wrote, you know, dealing, you know, subtly with, uh, with uh, the oncoming of the uh, pandemic, I think in, in March or early April. It's called Stay at Home. I'm looking out the window with the everydayness of Vermeer's young women, though threatening skies are carrying the day so far. What I'd give for a shaft of dusty light. A quart of milk is in the fridge, wine on the counter, and whatever this day finally delivers, it won't last. Let me help you, I say to the women. Goodbye, city. We expect you not to let yourself go. Let everything that was, that was be so again. Every cafe and bar more charming than any of us remember and how we will remember. We need to leave quickly, gone before you know it actually happened. A flash in time, no lament, just comradeship and a promise like Mendel's thumb waving at a busy Moscow. Don't worry, we'll be back. And speaking of cities, check out Dublin. Dublin, the foundling hospital closed for decades. A poem to honor the lost children lies bronzed under a tree in the nearby park. Paradise quietly refusing to be broken. No, no luscious day in spring capable of repairing every wound. A small salve like a small star will have to do. A shortcut for me now on my way to meeting friends at a pub. Late as usual, but always forgiven. And I will end with, since I started with the Nobel Prize, let's stick with at least poetry. Uh, this is called Reading a Poet Again After Many, Many Years. I have forgotten how beautiful his writing was how much I admired his strangeness and bravado and loved all the women he wrote about. His great sequence has lost none of its enchantment and power. The woman in the green sweater, the cows with the various, with various colored wings and the train track extending up to the moon. The time we let come between us seems so minuscule, despite the truth that I'm older and he's dead. Look at those cows flying by now. Look at how assured they are that this will continue forever. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Tim. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful, beautiful reading. I have to also say that 
the, the title A Donut and the Great Beauty of the World is uh, one of my favorite titles that I've heard in a while. <laughs> oh, thank you for that. Surprising and, and, and funny. Um, all right, so we'll finish our features section off um, with Pui Ying Wong, um, who is the author of two full-length collections of poems, An Immigrant's Winter from Glass Lyre Press 2016 and Yellow P Plum Season uh, from New York Quarterly Books in 2010. Along with two chapbooks, she's received a pushcart prize. Her poems have appeared in Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, Plume, New Letters, Zone 3, The New York Times, among others. Born in Hong Kong, she now lives in Cambridge, Mass, with her husband, the poet we just heard from, Tim Schumont. Um, uh, please welcome Pui. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, I just want to make sure that my voice is coming through. I yeah, I can, I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. So thank you for having me, uh, Jonathan and Mark. And it's really great to uh, be reading with Gloria and Annie and uh, Tim and to see our friends here. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm happy to say that next year, Matt Head will publish uh, a poetry book of mine. It's called The Feast. And I'm going to read the first three poems from that collection. Five stanzas. Not everything fits. Not every lesson is learned. The wind rubs off the water. The water rushes on the ground and overtakes the dam. Not every end is a beginning. Sun warms the woods. Moonlight dispels the dark and calms the sea. Not every light ends with a full stop. Without flower and worm. Yes, it was a bitter earth on which we wander like a troop. A midnight bus did not come and we were stranded along the fence of strangers. We nipple on little pieces of biscuits and dry cheese, the luxury taste of the farm. We learn that border is only a gate, some dog, the god's wild gestures. We were to divide here like a plant, like the living and the dying. Yes, nothing remains as it was. And like a hard flying trapezoid, we kneel by heart the rhythm of catch and release, catch and release, when it was our turn to tumble, hide and ride in the earth. Next poem is called Garong in May. Garong is a river in southwest France, which I, where I had the opportunity to go um, to attend um, a poetry workshop uh, in recent years. So here is the wrong in May. When I let the river answer, I hear the birds, wax wing, juncho. The gardener sniffs, children speak softly, the creek rambles. River, tell me how to rest. Why moments short as a head can become tolerance of sweat. When the river answers, it asks, have you come with memories, regrets, seasons, sorrow, all that you love? Do you still dream? What have you done with your bag of letters? This one is called Today It. Today it will be my presentiment, not hers or theirs, but my grandfather's. The ones he watered and pruned and sighed over on a dismal day. It's been half a century. They shall lift from the clay of memory into the cave of this land. August, Tom is from Kani. In an outer barrel's waking lord, 
a bush of moonflowers fur in the daylight. They are sensitive to the sun, flaring high on the tower. Bits of the season boiling over. Wait for the moon to rise and dark winds of turf emerge. Wait for the noise to die and the bedtime meal thicken. For muscles around the constricted nylons to relax. It's like the fragile voices of poets. They will open in fullness, in office, in the shadows. Well, could you speak up just a little, maybe? Okay. Thanks. The next poem um, I wrote um, um, is titled Be Water. And that was taken from um, a phrase that was used by Bruce Lee. And during the protest uh, last year in Hong Kong, the protester had adopted this phrase as a way of like a tactic when they were confronted with the police. Um, so is my voice coming through? Just wave it is. <laughs> it's much better, thank you. Much better, okay. Be water. Oh, by the way, uh, the emblem flower for Hong Kong is uh, Bohemia. Bohemias are bedraggled rules. The red of an empire spreads like jam over every street. The eye of the city looks back at its own watermark, twice colonized. In, a in the language of domination, what's changed is the world, is the way people are regarded, from subjects to children. The bullet misses the boy's heart by a fingernail. People walk out into the heat in black, learning the way of water. The eye of the city, thickened by tear gas, does not blink. So my last two poems were written uh, recently and really during the pandemic, and um, the last one very recent. And so here it is. Are we there yet? Do you love what you see? The air is exhilarating, so close to goddamn rain. We are dangling at the edge of the water. We are dancing on the golden sand. You got me dancing with you, even wild flowers ache. Only you strut. Forget me then. Don't forget how I love you my out of breath dancing. Too late for fiction, too much data. Fine, fine, fine. But a false one, and a false one. This could be the summit. We are really paper tigers swimming in the lava. We are going up, we are riding out of curve. Are you free, big man? How thin the air is, the peeping heart machines, the humming oxygen flow, I have no idea. We won't be saved by a navy ship, now to see the rising darkness. It was always our nether to squander the world. Birthday poem. This poem is for two. A December northeaster sweeps down Cambridge, bring ricocheting off the road like lead. A brave woman in yellow boots walk on with her coffee. Near the casino, a long windmill turns furiously like a roulette wheel. On this side of the room, my husband is holding a strawberry cake, where against the dusky world, candle things there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pui. That was beautiful. Um, I think I'll now hand the floor over to Cassandra Atherton, who will kick off the open mic portion of the event. Thank you so much to all our features. Uh, what a wonderful section of this. Evening. So 
inspiring. My goodness, what an amazing set of readings and amazing Karina for you to MC it all so beautifully. So it's it's often tricky coming after such great readings, but we've got amazing people who are going to read for us today. And the first person that we have in the house is Brian Franco, who is going to read for us. So Jonathan, can we unmute Brian and get him started with his poem? I did see him somewhere. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's still here. Oh, he was. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's there. Uh, hmm. Brian, come on, don't let us down. I can move to the next person and give him some time if he's away from his screen. Seems to be. He seems to be. Okay. Cindy Hockman is next. Um, she's a wonderful poet that often reads for us. So Cindy, can we ask you to read now, please? I think you've got to unmute. Mute. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a very short one. It's a haiku. I turned it out last week and I read it about an hour and a half ago at another reading. <laughs> wonderful. Well, wonderful. <laughs> because I too forget what I've read, but Anyway, it's silly, but it's called, So Why Can't We? Even in Damascus, they wear their damn masks made of damask or damask. I like that. Damask or damask. I like that. That's great. I love haikus. I also like hyben, so you should um, think about that form as well. Uh, next, we have John Wessick. So can we unmute John, please? Okay, I'm unmuted. Let's see. So here is sort of a Boston poem called City of Acute Angles. I awake in the round hours of night from dreams of rectangles and the A-frame I occupied on Euclid Street with its weeks of rented VHS tapes and drawer packed elbow deep with kibble for Spindley, the cocker spaniel who ears flying dived in and out of neighbors' hedges. First light scours dreams of home from shadowy corners, and I'm alone again in one of the high rises tessellated over the landscape of concrete and rust. The coffee maker sighs and the AC gasps as picture windows convert solar radiation to sweat. Since my stove applied for Medicare, it's become less motivated to fry. I count the wallpaper's liver spots while the elevator with sore knees climbs to my floor. It complains all the way to the garage in my daily demolition derby. Roads of concrete, roads of tar, winding roads, fractal, varicose, vein roads, roads to take you away, roads for your return, roads over bridges, roads with five-way stops, overpasses, underpasses, clover leaves, roads packed with semis, sedans, school buses, SUVs, pickups, gar garbage trucks, vans, and all the occupants' hopes and fears, figure skates and college funds, utility bills and mortgage rates, cheating husbands, shrewish wives, one class left for that MBA. I wouldn't trade an AMC gremlin with a bus stereo for any of it. After a day at my office cube, I pedal the elliptical while Paul's spout hyperbole on the radio with movies and novels banished to assisted living for repeating themselves. I have nothing but a question. Is this all there is? And I'd like to just squeak in a little haiku after Basho to honor our new uh, co-host. Even in Australia, the kookaburra's cry makes me long for Australia. So I have a couple new books. I'll put links in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And if I could say daily demonitional derby as well as you, I could get away with anything, I think, in this world. But um, yeah, the kookaburras, beautiful. I can recommend them, although they wake you up early in the morning. Uh, so we actually have Brian... Franco, who is back and ready to read. So can we unmute him, please, Jonathan? Uh, happy Hanukkah, everyone. And let me go ahead and read a poem for you. 
It is called A Most Honorable Warrior's Death. So many poetry people I know have said poetry has saved their lives. The same story is told in a million different voices around the world. Poets are warriors, poets are fighters, poets are Olympic pugilists. Our enemies, our nemeses, our sparring partners are simult simultaneously our mirrors and our past. Our present tense existences are fleeting moments in which we contemplate lives, decisions, relationships, families. Our words run through veins to hearts and through nerves to brains. We spit them out as poetry, exposing them to the elements sending them to a glorious death memorialized on page to be read both out loud and in silence, not only by us, but also others who have experienced pieces of our lives in their separate lives. Our epitaphs become their epitaphs. Our poetry is a graveyard that transforms death into life. Gracias, everyone. Wow, thank you so much. Couldn't agree more. Poetry is powerful as we've, we've seen today. Our next guest in the house is Bob Hemmen, who is going to read for us. I, uh, I did ask Bob because I quite like it when he reads. So Bob, are you around to read? Yes, I am. Excellent, thank you. And it's Heman. Sorry. That's it's okay. It's Australian accent. I'm, oh, no, I'm kidding. No, that's okay. Information. At this point in the plot, she twists her ankle. He watches the owls, the car runs out of gas. At this point in the plot, the railroad tracks curve out of sight. The notices posted on the power pole take on a new meaning. The dogs cry like babies. At this point, the trees become an exception, the room a mistake that gives them hope. At this point, they are taught the truth about the sky. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. Next, we have Jennifer Bado, unless I pronounced that one wrong as well. Jennifer? Wait a minute. I think, oh, hi there. No, you pronounced hi. it. It's uh, Bado. Yay! <laughs> Got it. I was cringing, <laughs> waiting yeah. for you to mispronounce it, but you did great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Notes on Hymen. Vestigial rose bouquet, magma of trauma. Do you remember how they entered first the door, then how they opened me and closed me, opened me, closed me, and closed me? Maybe you're in California, or maybe you're on the Death Star. I see you near a fire, dreaming of what I'll say when I'm bridalless and can blow words through my pearly moon conch shell flute. Come to me, my invisible companion. I'm so lonely. Let's go naked or wear the same rag for days and not brush our teeth. Our apple ferment gums will gleam. Tonight, though it's morning now, we'll run down Cherry Street toward rage. We'll grind the air, throw your blanket over us, leave our tongues exposed. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much. It was really moving. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two more people. We've got MP Carver up next in the house. MP, where are you? Oh, hi. Thank you so much. Uh, this is my first time at this reading series. Uh, it was wonderful. So thank you so much to everybody who read. Thanks I've just got a... Oh, yeah. I'm so glad I saw it on Facebook. So <laughs> um, I've just got one short one. M MP, do you know your video's off? Oh yeah, I do. Okay. I'm at I'm at home, so no problem. I guess everybody's at home, but I don't like my room, so. <laughs> <laughs> there go. Yeah. My friend's mom is CFO of some private equity holding company. My mom sells rings at the mall, where she glitters like a done-up but affordable diamond. Shuffles the eye. 
Retail is an ugly word. Let's try dalliance. Let's try dance. In her habitat, she is apex, trapper, catch and release a little lighter. My mom makes a sale seem like some half-remembered dream. Not the dream about falling through the ice, but the dream pulled out and fussed over till it's so warm it shines. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. I hope you'll come again and read some more. And we're going to finish the open mic with Karina Ballerina, as, as apparently she's known occasionally. Um, and she did a wonderful job today of emceeing. And I think it's nice to, to hear her at the very end with one of her own poems. So Karina, take it away. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm a bookend. Hopefully no one's sick of hearing from me. Um, and yeah, ballerina is something I'm called by several three-year-olds. Um, and I, I consider that an honor. Um, so I will end this open mic by reading a poem that will be in my uh, forthcoming book. Um, and it is called Warren. When you wake up slow, even at 11 years old, morning does too. It covers you in the weird hours when mom's gone already, deep into another breakfast shift or something. Although you feel even more alone than that, it's hard to explain. There are $3 bills on the counter. So you get hypnotic at the Saturday shows, spread dead center on the fourth hand futon left by big sister who crossed the ocean forever ago. Rabbits do this too, kid, you know? They wake and scan the warren with the same glass-eyed caution, already understanding that breakfast is somewhere in the big world. You're a rabbit in the morning, but it's not that easy wisecrack you're half watching now on the crummy TV box where Bugs has got your back and will stay chaste and wily, incredibly alive. Fantastic. Beautiful reading, well, well read. Well, there was some pretty top-notch lip balm today, people, I think. It was impressive from beginning to end. So I'm really thrilled that, uh, that you could all be with us. And I hope you'll come next week as well. I think Mark mentioned some of the amazing things we've got coming up. I'll, I'll do it again. I'll do it again quickly, I think. Yeah. So next, next week, um, we have Stephen Dunn, Morris Simons, Susanna H. Case, and Margot Tapsteva with guest MC Indran Amathiagam. And the week after that, uh, we have a founders reading on December 26th. Um, and our special guests will be Kyla Rodney, Joshua Corey, and Grace Cavalieri. So uh, please do join us for that. And it'll be up on the website pretty shortly. And thank you so much, all you wonderful featured readers. Thank you, Karina, for your emceeing. Uh, Thank you so much, Cassandra, for, for being part of us, fused together. Mark, can I, can I, give, can I give one more uh, shout out here? Uh, go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, so this coming week, uh, um, we have uh, an event for Spoke. Um, so so uh, Spoke is the, the journal I make with Kevin Gallagher, um, and we're finishing up our seven, seventh annual issue. We don't have that one quite yet, but this is what the last year's one looks like. Um, and I, we have a great issue and there'll be a launch event coming um, this Thursday, December 17th um, at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, please join if you can. Um, we have a great lineup of readers, including Christina Davis and Muhammad Shahid Alam. Um, and I'm gonna put the link to register uh, in the chat, but you can also register at Grolier Poetry website because Grolier will be putting that on. So I'm gonna put that in the chat right now. Thanks. Thank you, Karina. And um, as, as, as we said forthcoming, we will have a lot of very exciting, you know, cross international things going on. So stay tuned. Thank you again, you wonderful readers tonight, including Karina, of course, uh, Annie Pluto, Gloria Mindock, Tim Schulmont, and Pui Ying Wong. Thank you so much. Uh, wishing you all safety, health, happiness, uh, gentle life, and lots and lots of poetry, lots of love. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.